Well, pretty shabby crowd here, isn't it? We welcome you to this presentation called A CPA's Guide to Grantor Trusts. Well, CPA stands for Certified Pain in the You Know What. And there's a lot to be known here. There's no way to cover this in 30 minutes. So we're not even going to try. We're going home now. We're done. This is completely, completely insane to try to cover this type of thing in only 30 minutes. It makes my head spin. Okay, we got Brandon Ketrin here, and Gasman's going to join us later. Not as smart as Ketrin and much shorter, by the way. And Brandon, take it away. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so we're here today to talk a little bit about Grantor Trust. Uh, we have some information here on uh, how to ask questions. So feel free to pop in and ask any questions that you might have during the presentation. We'll try to get to those. Um, if we're not able to, we'll we'll try to get back to you via email after the presentation. And of course, that always helps us for guiding where we're going to go next as far as presentations go. So feel free to chime in in the question box there. So what are we going to talk about? Well, really, we're here to talk about a new revenue ruling issued by the IRS uh, last week called Revenue Ruling 2023-2. And what the revenue ruling addressed was the basis of assets in a grantor trust uh, following the grantor's death, whether or not those get a step up in income, income tax basis as a result of the grantor's death. And a short and sweet summary here is the IRS has basically said that if the assets in that trust are included in your estate, such as a revocable trust, then you get a step up. If they're not included in your estate, such as in an irrevocable grantor trust that's outside of your estate for estate tax purposes, they do not get a step up. Now, that's been a topic of conversation between many estate planners for many years. The IRS has never formally ruled on this until now, and, and we think they got it wrong, but the ruling is still out there. So the question is now, what can we do? What do we think about it? You know, what all, um, where are we going from here? So we wrote this article and we, we provided it here in the slides just to give you a little bit of background on the situation. And, you know, the IRS gave us this pretty clear example in the revenue ruling. So the facts are that I established an irrevocable trust, funded it with assets that was a completed gift for gift tax purposes. So I established a trust for the benefit of my, my kids. I put a million dollars of Apple stock into that trust. Its basis was, let's say 500,000 whenever I put it in. Now, seven years later, it's appreciated to $2 million. I pass away. What is the trust basis in those assets? Well, the IRS has said it's the original $500,000 you had when you transferred it. It does not get a step up at income tax basis. So where was the confusion? Why did planners think that you get a step up in basis? Well, it comes from the language in the statute, Internal Revenue Code Section 1014B1, which we have here at the bottom of slide eight which says that you get a step up if the property is acquired by bequest, devise, inheritance, or by the decedent's estate from the decedent. So when you think about a grantor trust, the way those operate is that the grantor of the trust is treated as the owner of the assets for income tax purposes. So any sell between the trust is disregarded, any transaction between the trust is disregarded with the grantor, and for all purposes of the code, the grantor is treated as owning these assets. So when the grantor dies, we always thought that under B1 here, that now the property is passing from the grantor by devised inheritance or otherwise to a new trust that's a non-grantor trust. So for the first time, we have a transfer from the grantor to a trust and that occurred by reason of death of the decedent and therefore those assets should get a step up in basis. The IRS doesn't agree with that position. They explain why in this revenue ruling. So that's kind of where we're at today. Alan, any kind of initial thoughts on that summary of the revenue ruling and, and what the IRS is saying here? Yes, this has been an area open and very controversial now for a few years. 
going back to Internal Re Revenue Code Section 671 says, if I set up a trust, it's irrevocable, it's for my family, and let's say, for example, I have the right to replace trust assets with assets of equal value, we know under Section 671 of the code that all of the income and deductions of the trust go on my personal income tax return. So when this provision of the code was passed decades ago, Congress didn't say that the trust would be completely disregarded for income tax purposes. It said that the income and deduction of the trust would go on my personal return. It didn't say, for example, that if I transfer assets to that trust in exchange for other assets, that I would have to recognize that as a capital gain, or that if I paid interest to that trust, that I would have to pick that up as income, even though, even though my payment of interest is not deductible. This guidance was not given. So in the early 1980s, there was litigation between the IRS and a taxpayer in a case called Rothstein, R-O-T-H-S-T-E-I-N. And in Rothstein, the taxpayer took a capital loss he transferred assets to his trust, which was a 671 trust, and he took a capital loss, and the IRS said, you can't do that. This trust is disregarded for income tax purposes. When you sell something to this trust, you can't take a loss, and when you pay interest to this trust, you can't write it off. So they went to court, and the court ruled with the IRS and Rothstein appealed the case and the appellate court sided with uh, the IR sided which way did they side Brandon they saw they uh, they saw with the tax pay uh, the sided with Mr. Rothstein because it's disregarded right so the IRS in 1985 issued Revenue Ruling 85-13, which said, we're not going to go along with what Mr. Rothstein did. We're not going to allow these losses. We're not going to allow these interest deductions. When you make a transaction with a grant or trust, it is disregarded. There's no income or loss. The trust is simply an extension of the purpose of the person. So when the IRS did this in, in 1985, many of the tax lawyers at that time, and I was one of them, but wasn't smart enough to realize how important this was, they said, look at this, now we can sell assets to a grant or trust and not have to report this for income tax purposes and get these assets out of our estate. As a matter of fact, we can use the low interest rate note laws, which were somewhat unpredictable, I think, back then, and get these assets out of the estate. And we think we could also consider that the taxes paid by the grantor on the trust at income is not considered a gift to the trust, all because of Revenue Ruling 85-13. So now these beautiful, wonderful Granter Trusts have some beautiful features. One, you can sell assets to the trust for a low interest rate promissory note, have no income tax event, and two, your client can pay the tax on the trust income, and that's not considered to be a gift to the trust. And the IRS even came out with a revenue ruling that said that. Well, the third leg of the table, or the fourth leg of the table, was, well, when the grantor dies, is it still disregarded? Well, if you read 8513, if you can, if the grantor can exchange assets and it's disregarded, why wouldn't it be disregarded when the grantor dies. So many of us 
have been advising our clients that we think that the appropriate position when a client dies and they are the grantor of a disregarded trust to go ahead and assume that there is a step up. This hit the news and it became very controversial in the tax community. I would say that in the community of the hundred most followed and well thought of tax authorities in the top hundred, probably five think that there's a step up and 95 think that there is no step up or they're silent on this. Well, guess what? The tax law is not based upon voting or popularity. The tax law is based on the Internal Revenue Code and what judges decide the tax law should be. And I don't know about you, but I have not found judges in the tax area to be all that predictable. So we feel that this could go either way. And I personally feel that it's more likely to go with the step up but here comes the IRS under intensive pressure on Treasury Secretary Yeltsin. Multiple letters written to her by senators, including Senator Warren and Senator Sanders, saying, this is too good to be true, take it away. So nine days after the last letter, the IRS releases Revenue ruling 2023-2, only the second revenue ruling of 2023, and says, we don't think there's a step up. And they explain it by not explaining it. <laughs> they simply say, we don't think there's a step up. They don't say because Secretary Yellen told us to say this. They just say, we don't think there's a step up. now. Keep in mind that they issued a private letter ruling a few years ago in a foreign matter where they did allow the step up. And maybe that was a mistake and it's not precedential. My bigger concern now is whether they're going to turn or overturn revenue ruling 85-13 and whether we're going to have any clients who are going to say, oh, I wish we had done an installment sale before they overturned this. Because that would wreak havoc on estate tax planning for the ultra wealthy. So again, to summarize, we believe in a lot of things. I don't believe in Peter Pan. I don't believe in Casper the ghost, but I do believe that you can get a step up on the death of a granter. The IRS doesn't agree now you would have to disclose on your tax return definitely that you're taking a, a uh, position contrary to the IRS. So what we're going to see now is that people are going to fill out their income tax return and assume there's no step up and pay the capital gains tax or not take the depreciation. And then they're going to file an amended return and ask for a refund so that they are, for most purposes, penalty proof. And then they're going to wait and see if the IRS computer just gives them their refund or whether the IRS audits it. And then we're going to have a court case come down. And then we're going to see how the courts rule on this issue. Yeah, and Alan, I think that's kind of a an interesting point is, you know, the, the revenue rollings aren't the law, right? It's just the IRS's interpretation of a set of facts. And, you know, the set of facts was the assets are in a trust, the grantor dies, do they get a step up? The IRS says no. The courts and the tax court, you know, aren't obligated to follow that. It's not precedential. It's just the IRS's interpretation. And these revenue rulings have been overturned in the past by courts, and the IRS occasionally does get it wrong. So just because they've issued this ruling doesn't mean that that is the law of the land. Yes, it does mean that you have to disclose on your tax return if you take a position contrary to that, but it certainly doesn't mean that this is a final kind of determination of the issue. It, it may be years before we get the court case that kind of 
lays that out. Um, so we'll just kind of have to wait and see, you know, what happens here moving forward. Let, um, let me let me ask you, you, if you're if you can go to the questions panel, you see the rectangle that you have here. If there's a questions panel, and if you click on the upside down pyramid, you can type in a question. But we would like to know what you think. And at the end of this, I can go ahead and read out without revealing your name what you actually think about this. Okay, sorry, Brandon, back to you. Yeah. No, that's that's fine. I think that'd be interesting to know. Um, so a couple of things. I just wanted to to walk through, you know, one of the common transactions here with the grantor trust, and then we'll talk about, you know, if you have one of these grantor trusts in existence, some things that you could do to kind of take a conservative approach to maybe not getting the basis step up. And then the other thing I wanted to to go through was, well, if you don't get the basis step up, does it still make sense to do this type of transaction? So here's uh, the basic scenario. We have a, a husband and wife. They have uh, assets under an LLC with voting and non-voting interest. Uh, there's around 19.5 million of assets under this LLC. So husband and wife, they both set up these two new irrevocable trusts. They make a small seed capital gift to the trust, generally about 10% of the value of what we expect to sell to this trust. So if we have 19 million of assets, you know, one half of that is around 8 million, taking into account around a 30% a discount. So we put 800,000 into the trust. Then husband takes his 49.5% non-voting interest sells that to the trust in exchange for a note at um, pretty low interest. These rates used to be much lower in the last two years, but they've, they're creeping up now, but still pretty favorable rate. We can expect the assets underneath this LLC to grow at a greater rate than the interest rate on the note, and therefore able to pass out that appreciation outside of the, the, uh, the estate. Wife does the same thing makes the seed capital gift, sells her 49.5% interest in exchange for a note. So that's, you know, as of today, we pay annual interest on that note. It's not the balloon payment on the principal is not due for another 20 years down the road. And as the assets grow in value after 10 years, they might grow to uh, you know, 30 million approximately netted value against the note is around 23 million remaining into these this LLC. So half of that's owned by the SLAP, half of that's owned by the Descendants Trust. So you can see the amount of appreciation in the state tax savings that can occur because of this transaction. 20 years down the road, you know, we might have 31 million net total in, in the LLC, which is owned 99% by these trusts outside of the estate. So this is a, a pretty powerful planning tool um, that makes sense to um, save a lot of estate taxes. Now the question is, what happens when husband or wife dies? Do these assets get stepped up in value? Well, IRS says no, we think yes, but we don't know what the answer is currently until a court would actually make that decision. So does it make sense to do this? Do we lose losing that step up? Is it still worth it to save estate taxes? Well, I think kind of as a, a general matter, the answer would be yes, it still does make sense to do this. And the reason why is if you think about it, the estate tax applies on the fair market value of assets at a 40% tax rate. The income tax savings from a step up in basis is really savings on generally capital gains at a 20% rate on only the appreciation above your basis, not the total value of the asset. So you have here a 40% rate versus a 20% rate, and then a 40% rate on the fair market value versus a 20% rate on just the appreciation. So I think as a general matter, yes, it would still make sense to do estate tax planning. But let me show you some, some numbers that are also interesting to kind of drive that home a little bit. If I can, Alan, can you let me share screen? I thought you were sharing screen. I think we're on your screen. Okay, I'll take off my screen. Brittany, how do I allow? There we go, I think I got it now. Oh, there you go. You see the chart here? 
Yeah. Okay, perfect. So this is a you know one of our, our charts that we've shown in the past. Um, and we added this income tax analysis side of it to, to look at this from, well, if we don't get a step up on in the assets, you know, what, what does that look like from a savings standpoint? So this is a qualified personal residence. And, and generally this is a this works the same way as the installment sale because it's a freeze type transaction. We're we're taking the value of the assets today, paying tax, gift tax on that, and then allowing the appreciation to kind of accrue outside of the estate. So we have a home that's worth 1.9 million. Its basis is 1.6, so there's about a $300,000 gain there. Um, the way the Cooper works, there's a certain retained term. I won't get into the, the details of that, but you know, if you die with the asset in your estate, you're going to get the step up anyway. But after that retained term, it's outside of your estate. So with the value of the home growing at 3% per year, in 10 years from now, it's going to be worth around 2.5 million. We still have that same carryover basis, so we have a, a pretty significant gain there. If we pay taxes at 28.8%, which is the capital gains rate, plus if you're in a state that has state income tax, we tack that on just to, to make the numbers. I think this is a, a New York uh, a state um, tax around 8.8%, and you can see the income taxes that would apply. But the estate tax savings from allowing this appreciation to pass outside of the estate was around 775,000. So we still netted a $540,000 savings here in this scenario. Now, even if we were to have to pay ordinary income on that at 41.8% tax rate, still the same savings. So here's another example. What happens if the basis was only half of that whenever I sold the property? I'll plug those numbers in. And what does that look like? Well, still, if we're at capital gains rate, even after nine years or 10 years, we still have more estate tax savings than we did income tax loss from not receiving a step up. At ordinary rates, same thing, except for that first year, which we're almost breaking even, we have savings on the estate tax side versus a loss on, on the income tax side. So I think that just shows, you know, even if you don't get a step up, it's probably still worthwhile to continue with the planning um, as you traditionally have with these assets. So I'll flip it back to your screen and we can go back to the, the PowerPoint. Okay. Let me find my screen. There my you go. Screen. Okay. So we've got seven, we've got seven minutes remaining. So let me see where I So, first of all, Brandon, your chart, I really like your chart. Does it take into account that you would pay estate tax nine months after death, but you may not sell the assets and create capital gains until 10, 20 years after death? It, it does not. So, it's just an immediate, you know, I, I die and the property is sold. So, I think that's another good point. That yeah, yeah, your estate tax is due at death versus capital gains, you know, may never be due if you hold on to the asset. Right. The other, the other thought, though, is, for example, if, if it's five million in net value, but it's a twenty million apartment complex, subject to a fifteen thousand uh, dollar mortgage, then the five million of inclusion in the estate and the estate tax of two million may be more important than getting a full step up on a twenty million dollar building and the ability to take component depreciation right after the death of the grantor. So it's not always going to be the numbers we just showed. The second thing I want to mention is, so, you know, I set up a grantor trust for Marsha and, and our descendants, and we'd like to get a step up in basis on my death. Well, maybe we won't, but what if we give my brother, who's older than me, a power of appointment over the trust assets where he could appoint the trust assets to creditors of his estate to the extent this would not cause him to be subject to estate tax and only with the permission of my next door neighbor. So then if my brother dies before me, there's gonna be a step up while I'm living, which may get me depreciation write-offs, which, so one thing is third party powers of appointment will be used more often 
and siblings of the grantor or even the parents of the grantor can be used to get a step up in basis. The other thing to look at though, is if you don't think the step up's gonna occur or you're concerned that the step up may not occur, go ahead and buy those low basis assets from the grantor trust before the grantor dies. If the grantor's not in good shape and the grantor trust owns a $20 million apartment complex with a $2 million basis and you can and has 20 million cash, get, guess what? Put the 20 million cash into the trust and take the uh, building back out. Yeah. Or have the grantor borrow money from a bank and then buy the appreciated assets from the trust shortly before the grantor dies. The grantor could put those assets into a preferred partnership arrangement so that future growth on the assets would be limited as far as what would go into the grantor's estate. Now, number three here, thank you, Mike Mulligan, for calling me or emailing me and saying, wait, don't do this. It may not work. So I said, number three, the grantor could just buy assets from the trust for a note but then the grantor owes a note to the trust. So Brandon, here's what Mike Mulligan emailed me about. He said, Alan, if you owe a $10 million note to a trust and you die and your estate owes this note, when your estate pays the trust $10 million, does the trust have $10 million of income? Does yeah. the note have a zero basis? Right. It's It's really the inverse of dying with a installment cell note still in place with the grantor and the question has always been you know what is the grantor's basis in that note is it the basis of the assets when they're sold is it fair market value and so that's an interesting question and yeah if, if you want to be conservative then I, I i think i would borrow from the bank right and then use cash to buy the assets from the trust if that's feasible you know as a practical matter that might be a little bit difficult but um, yeah, so the question remains, you know, what's the trust basis in the note? I could see the IRS taking the position that it, that it would be zero and therefore, um, you know, gain would apply whenever you paid the note. But then okay. again, you know, the question might be is if you have an installment obligation like that, you get the basis step up allowing, you know, a asset to be sold without tax, you get depreciation deductions, and then you have an installment obligation where you're paying tax over time and really deferring that out. So when you kind of net present value everything, the the basis step up still might be more beneficial than, you know, the tax obligations that can be deferred over many years with the installment sale. Okay, so then let me see. I got a comment from Robert. Seems to me is the if the assets are not in the grantor's estate, then the assets do not get a step up on death of the grantor. What happens when the value of the assets have declined? Does the beneficiary get a step down? And I think the answer, you you know, you may be right, and then there would be a step down. Um, then another another writer says, I am a prominent author and have studied this carefully and have gone to a, a number of grantor trust anonymous meetings where we discuss admitting whether there is a step up. I agree completely with Alan Gassman that there is a step up and it's signed J. Edgar Hoover. So at least J. Edgar Hoover, if he's alive, agrees with me. Okay, then finally from Tony, what specifically should a grantor's trust information letter contain so that the trust information can be included on the grantor's 1040 return? Do you have any examples? Brandon, do you want to? Well, the first, I want to make sure the answer is it doesn't have to say anything. No matter what, the income goes on the grantor's trust return. You don't have to pull a switch or write the letter, but you're supposed to send them a letter. And Brandon, what does the letter say? Here's my social security number. Here's the trust number. Here's my name. I am not J. Edgar Hoover, and is that it? Yeah, so that's uh, that's basically it. I, I, you know, a lot of times, and and uh, Tony, we can send you an, an example that that we that we have kind of sterilized from another client, and it's yeah, it's 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 pretty simple. It's 
the items of, of income and loss shown on the attached schedule are reported on, you know, grantors, tax return under EIN, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, if you want to schedule out the items of income and loss that were reported under the EIN of the trust that are, you know, then flowing over to the grantors return, that's probably the, the best practice. And uh, so I send you an example of how that would look and how we've done it for other clients. Okay. And then Brandon, anything else you want to uh, mention before we sign off? Yeah, no, I think that's that's a you know one situation. You know, we included Ed Morrow's list the article there as the end that that courts have have approved reformation of trust to add general powers of appointment. So if you have clients that aren't subject to estate tax or relatives that aren't subject to estate tax, you can actually have the court modify a trust to add those general powers to cause estate tax inclusion, which clearly gets a step up. And uh, the IRS has respected that, and they've approved that in PLR. So that's another planning planning tool that you could use to to get around this revenue ruling. What did he just say? I'm not really sure. He went really fast. All right. Well, thanks everyone for attending, and may the rest of your day be fillable. Bye.